Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying parables. In my last video, we talked a little bit about the leaven that was hidden in the meal. Uh, that was sort of an introductory uh, parable to this series. And I think that what we saw in that parable what stood out the most was the kingdom the thousand year reign of Christ but more than that into eternity the entire kingdom of the heavens which is not doesn't come about through external change but through internal change which is the same which is true of us in our own personal lives as far as our our sanctification goes and and so there has been an interest expressed in the subject of parables we're going to go through and look at a few it's there's many ways to present these parables you could do it in order in the order in which they were given um, many of the commentators believe that there are 39 parables of jesus some say 40. Uh, some have even suggested there's as many as 50. I can't tell you exactly how many that there are. I do know that uh, these parables, and I, and I gave it, when it, in my introduction to parables, I sort of gave it the definition of what that, what that was. It's, uh, in all reality, it's not, these, these parables are, are, it doesn't mean that there actually really were these people in these parables. They were illustrations that the Lord used to teach truth. Now, I find it very interesting that he says that he's going to, he's going to utter things kept secret before the foundation of the world. That is, things never before revealed in the Old Testament. I also find it enormously interesting that we actually see election in the very nature of many of these parables. You're going to notice that as we go down through that. That's not a popular subject nowadays. He said it has been given, given. Let's, let's underscore that word given. It's been given to you, he said, to understand. That is, by God's divine sovereign grace, not to them. And I, I think I drew a parallel between that which occurred then in that sense and, and today in which we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, our one teacher and comforter who teaches us and comforts us, instructs us, guides us, directs us, enlightens us. Uh, if God doesn't enlighten us to the truth of His Word, it's merely propositional revelation. It has, there's nothing for faith to be built upon. We, have, we need to understand it as God understands it because God doesn't give us faith to believe in something that's not true. And we don't ha all have, or we don't have all faith. None of us have all faith. That's, that's another important uh, subject to discuss because whatsoever is not of faith is sin, but that's not the purpose of this video. It is my intention to point out here from the outset of this, of part two here, that in Matthew chapters 21 through 23, what we see is we see God's formal rejection of Israel as a nation, His people. Not that He's rejected His people. Not that He's abandoned His people. But Israel was set aside in unbelief. And we're seeing that in the context of these three chapters. There are other places as well, but Matthew 21 through 23. I want to talk about three parables in this one video that I've uh, specifically chosen to, uh, to try to help us along as we begin our journey through these parables. Uh, the one is the parable of the wicked tenants. 
the other, another would be the parable of the banquet. And another would be the parable of the ten virgins. I do appreciate all of your comments, all of your questions. Uh, you need to understand and, and your suggestions on where, how to how to actually present these parables. Um, several of you have written to me asking me if I could address this parable or this parable. I'm going to try to do that to the best of my ability. It is vital that you understand concerning this subject of parables that I am no source of truth. I don't have a handle on all these parables. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't uh, it's, it's not exactly, it hasn't been primarily been the, the primary focus of my study uh, as, as I've walked with the Lord for over 35 years now. Uh, but it, it is an enormously challenging subject. In fact, there are many who say that, that just about the hardest Bible study you can do is on parables. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that these parables, it's been my experience that many of these parables have been, uh, have not been understood in, in, the, in their correct context. So we're going to start with the parable of the ten virgins. You'll find this in Matthew 25. Or, I'm sorry, we're going to start with the parable of the wicked tenants, which we find in Matthew 23, uh, 33 through 46. There's a parallel verse in Luke chapter 20. And I want to try to get you folks to put yourself in the time period in which this was spoken. I'd like to start out with, in this first parable, the, the, the parable of the wicked tenants. I'd like to start out with you in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, uh, verses 9 through 18. Now, he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it, and he digged a place for the wine fat. He built a tower, and he let it out uh, to husband, husbandmen, and he went into a far country. Verses, uh, verse, verse 1. A certain man planted a vineyard. He set a hedge about it. He digged a place for the wine fat. He built a tower. He, he let it out to husband. Right at the beginning, we're looking at an individual who invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources into this vineyard. He led it out to husbandmen, went into a far country, and at, and at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. Please, folks, keep your minds focused on what, at what time that he's saying this parable, who he's speaking it to, and what he's talking about. Because Israel, his people Israel, is heavily in the context here. They caught him, they beat him, that's verse 3, and sent him away empty. And again, he sent unto them another servant, and at him they cast stones, and they wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully, handled. I hardly know how to put into words how the nation of Israel, and in particular the religious element of that nation, with its chief priests, uh, scribes, Pharisees, chief priests, uh, how that they mismanaged the economy that God had placed upon them, the dispensation that God had placed upon them. 
When Jesus arrives on the scene, he's confronted with a religious establishment of his, his time, which were very much like the ones that he let this out to. There in verse 1. So again, he sends unto them another servant, and at, and at him they cast stones, and wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully handled, handled. And again, he sent another, and him they killed. They killed. And many others. Beating some, and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, now surely at this point, we're, we're getting the picture, of God's people suffering under, I guess, under the, the rule and the authority of a religious establishment that had run amok, that had gone off the beaten path, off the straight and narrow way. They weren't functioning as a people as God intended. Christ arrives on the scene He sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. Well, did they? No, they didn't. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him. And the, and the inheritance shall be ours. Folks, we don't work for our inheritance. An, an inheritance is an inheritance. The only reason that you are an heir, that you inherit something, is because you are an heir. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He asks them he will come and he answers his own question he will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others and the only reason that we sit here today that we have any relationship with god almighty is because god set israel aside in unbelief and turned his attention to the gentiles the gentiles all those nations other than Jews, all people other, other than Jews. The, uh, the word there, Gentile, it's, it's, it's from where we get the word ethnic. The nations. Verse 10, And have you not read this Scripture? This was the Lord's doing. This was the Lord's doing. Sure, Israel was set aside in unbelief, but it was God's intention that He turn His attention to the Gentiles. So it was in God's marvelous, designed plan, overall plan of redemption. In, all, in God's wisdom, this was how salvation would come to the Gentiles. It's, it's almost difficult, almost impossible, I think, for many of us to to believe and understand and accept the fact that God will take, God actually takes in the lives of His people even their unbelief and He works it for the overall good. Can you say that about your own life? Typically, we want to do just the opposite. It's the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on Him. But, but they feared the people. There were many who had... Keep in mind, this was uh, shortly after Jesus' triumphal entry. You know, here you've got all these people. That, that they're really, you know... They were expecting Me. They, they, they love... They love the fact that I that I've I have arrived. I've come. I've, I've I appeared. Why aren't you? They feared the people. 
for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. So they, they understood that Jesus was talking about them. And they left him and went their way. If you jump down to verse 43, <coughs> Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation. That's a, that's a foreign race. That's what the word means. Bringing forth the fruits thereof. Keep in mind that in Matthew chapters 21 through 23, we see God's formal rejection of Israel. You know, these in the context of the confrontation that Jesus had with those religious leaders of His time, the Pharisees and Sadducees, Israel is set aside, salvation comes to the Gentiles, enter the church, the church, that's you and me, exit the church, and well, and now we have an invitation. An invitation. That's a little different than John the Baptist's invitation. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. It was a legitimate offer. Jesus came and offered Himself as King, offered Himself, offered the kingdom. They, they wanted neither. Oh, they wanted a kingdom, but, the, but they wanted a kingdom that was mapped according to their own design. In many New Testament passages, the relation between Christ and the church is, is revealed by the use of the figures of the bridegroom and the bride. Uh, we know that from a number of verses. At the translation of the church, Christ is appearing as a bridegroom to take His bride unto Himself so that the relationship that was pledged might be consummated and that the two might become one. That the time of this marriage is revealed in Scripture is falling between the rapture of the church and the second coming. Prior to the rapture, the church is still anticipating this union. According to Revelation 19.7, when we were studying through the book of Revelation in the 19th chapter, the 7th verse, this marriage has taken place at the time of the second coming, the marriage, when Christ returns, the marriage has already taken place. Because the declaration is the marriage of the Lamb is come. That the aorist tense translated is come, it signifies a completed act showing us that the marriage has been consummated. The marriage is seen to follow the events of Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, because when she appears, she appears in the righteousness of the saints. Which can only refer to those things that have been accepted at the judgment seat of Christ. So the marriage itself has to be placed between the judgment seat of Christ and the second coming. The place of the marriage can only be heaven. It can be nowhere else. Because it follows the judgment seat of Christ which is shown to be in the heavenlies. And it is from the air that the church comes when the Lord returns. That's what we're looking forward to with great anticipation. The marriage must take place in heaven. No other location would fit a heavenly people. The participants in that marriage, the, the marriage of the Lamb is an event which, which ev evidently it, it involves only Christ and the church. It'll be shown later according to Daniel chapter 12 and uh, Isaiah chapter 26 that 
The resurrection of Israel and the Old Testament saints will not take place until the second coming of Christ. Revelation 20 makes it absolutely clear that tribulation saints will not be resurrected until that time as well. So it's necessary to distinguish between the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper. We're going we're gonna to be talking about this when we look at the ten virgins. The marriage of the Lamb is, is an event that has particular reference to the church and it takes place in heaven. The marriage supper is an event that involves Israel and it takes place on the earth. We know that from Matthew to Luke where Israel is awaiting the return of the bridegroom and the bride, the wedding feast or the wedding supper is located on the earth and it has particular reference to Israel. So the wedding supper, folks, the wedding feast, then becomes the parabolic picture of the entire millennial age to which Israel will be invited during the tribulation period which invitation many will reject and so they'll be cast out and many will accept and they'll be received in because of the rejection the invitation will likewise go to gentiles so that many of them will be included we're going to see that in these parables So Israel at the second coming will be waiting for the bridegroom to come from the wedding ceremony. Oh, this is beautiful. And invite them to that supper at which, at, at, at which time the bridegroom will introduce his bride to his friends, Israel. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Going back to that verse 12, And they sought to lay hold on Him, but feared the people, for they knew that He had spoken the parable against them. And they left Him. And they went their way. They knew that He was speaking of them. Now when we come to the parable of the banquet there in Matthew chapter 22, we're still in the context of Israel's former rejection of Christ and Christ setting Israel aside for the sake of the Gentiles. Matthew, let's go to chapter 22. And Jesus answered and spake unto, unto him again by parables and said, The kingdom of the heavens is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. That's Israel during the tribulation period through the God, preaching of the gospel of the kingdom for the kingdom of heaven is at hand his own people Israel will many will re not receive that message not welcome that message tell them which are bidden behold I have prepared my dinner my oxen my fatlings are killed and all the things are ready come unto the marriage but they made light of it and went their ways one to his farm another to his merchandise and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So, go ye therefore into the highways, and as, and as I love the language the Holy Spirit is using here, and as many as ye shall find, 
Now we're looking at Gentiles. Bid to the marriage. Gentiles during the tribulation period. That's the context, folks. Of course, it's hard for us to understand that because our minds get confused. We know that the tribulation period is in the future and we're looking at the past here, but Jesus came and offered the kingdom when He came and they rejected it. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king, the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which he didn't have on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And folks, if you don't see that wedding garment as the righteousness that we've been made in Christ, then you're missing the meaning of those words. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, many are called, well, of course many are called. The, the message of the truth of the Gospel, folks, goes out to everyone. Everyone. But few choose Him. No, oh, wait a minute. Wait, that's not what the text says. For many are called, but few are chosen. Chosen. And I live in a world I live in a Christian world in which those words chosen and foreordained and, and, and foreknown and predestined and predetermined and all those lovely, marvelous words of our sovereign God were, that teach me that he's, he, he is in absolute control, that He is absolutely sovereign, that He has a right to have a family, His own family, well, we don't like that. You know, it's 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 okay for us to, to I guess to, to think that we to think that we choose our own family, folks. You didn't even you didn't even you didn't choose your family. You didn't choose where you were born. You didn't choose who your parents were going to be, what what city you were going to be grow, grow up in, or anything else. It was all by God's sovereign design every single step of your life. It's no different than it was for the Apostle Paul or any other of the other disciples or any other Christian who's ever lived. Your very life is directed and guided by a loving Heavenly Father who loves you and knows what's best for you. And we don't like that either. We don't like that either. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now we get down to the parable of the ten virgins, which has been so... Well, let me just put it... The, the, whole, the, whole, the wagon's tipped over on this one, okay? The parable of the ten virgins. Well, we're all, we're all a bunch of virgins, and there's wise ones, and there's foolish ones, and some have oil in their lamp, and some don't. And if you have oil, well, maybe you'll make it to heaven. And if you don't, well, you won't. Or, or if you have oil in your in your lamp, then you're really one of the good. You're you're one of the. the, the you fall in that category of you're a, really a good Christian. Uh, those that didn't have oil in their lamp are not, but uh, many associate it with the rapture of the church, which is just plain foolish. If if they bothered to look at the context, they wouldn't say that we Christians. Are, are ten virgins, five of us wise, five of us foolish, and if we have oil, we got to have that oil in our lamp, before, or we ain't going to make the rapture. If you want to talk about a parable that has been so misconstrued, so turned into something ugly, something that it's not. 
then you believe that nonsense. It's your right. You can do that. I can't do that, folks, with the Word. I can't do that with the context. Matthew 25, starting at verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of the heavens be likened unto ten virgins. This is the kingdom of the heavens, not the kingdom of God, where we're born again into a spiritual new birth into the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of the heavens. The thousand year reign of Christ and beyond. They took their lamps and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now hold on a minute. If this is the rapture, folks, that makes no sense at all. Because the marriage has already taken place in heaven. And he's talking to his people, Israel. And believe me, there will come a time when this passage, Matthew 25, will mean a whole heck of a lot to those who are in the tribulation period. Both Jew and Gentile. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the, the bridegroom cometh. We're looking at the second coming of Christ, folks. We are in heaven getting married and being rewarded at this time. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Can't do it. I can't take, you can't take the Holy Spirit in you and give it to someone else. Can't do it. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now don't let that word buy, purchase, throw you. We don't buy our salvation. We don't buy the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's not what that's saying. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage supper, the banquet. The word marriage there covers not just the marriage of, of the bride of Christ in heaven. The entire, let me tell you, look. The door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I don't even know you. If you're a Christian today, worried about that maybe being you, well, let me just tell you that in order for it to refer to you at all, you're going to have to be alive in the tribulation period with no oil in your lamp. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The context is clearly the second coming, the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ, not the rapture. Not the rapture. Not the rapture. Stop calling your Christian friends today virgins. You know, you, you guys, y'all are foolish, but we're wise and, or, you know. You're not a virgin. You've been married to Christ. Uh, last I checked, someone who's married, who's married is, not, is, not a, is no longer a virgin. We're not virgins, wise or foolish. We are the bride of Christ. We aren't being invited uh, to the wedding feast. The, mar the, the, the marriage has already taken place 
in heaven. Of course the bride was invited to the wedding. You know, I fully expect the bride will attend both her wedding and the wedding feast. And the wedding, folks, always precedes the wedding feast. So this is not, this is not a picture of some evangelistic message being preached to masses of people who can come if they want to come and be saved. The invitation, dearly beloved, here is to His people in the tribulation period to expect His return with the kingdom in view. How many times have I suggested to you folks the importance of context? Context. At the time that these were written, there was not a Christian alive walking on the face of the earth. Does that mean there's just no application for us? Well, of course it doesn't mean that. Of course there's an application for us here. If nothing else, we're learning how God is dealing with His people down through history. It's not until we get to Acts that we even see a church. And I'm going to close this second part with a word of, of prayer. And I want to thank you all for hanging with this. It appears as though we're going to continue on in our study through these parables. If you have any suggestions, write and let me know. I love you all. I truly do. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for this opportunity and every opportunity that You give us to feast together on Your Word we love you. We truly do. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, thanking you constantly for who you are and all that you've done in our lives. I ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish and ignorant, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, that which you would have us know. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.